I'm now starting another chapter in the Odyssey. Begins in 1922, late 1922, uh, and goes on to 23. By 1922, my parents, A, had married. They were married on January 1st, 1919. They lived through 1918, 1919, 1920, maybe 2021, through a horrible period in Russian history. Civil war with various kinds of armies sweeping across the land, including especially that part of the country where they lived. I couldn't even begin to list all the armies. And a good number of them had, however, one thing in common. When they came to a Jewish town, they started murdering. So, um, uh, whether they were Ukrainians or whites or anarchists or, so or social democrats and so on, they did the same thing. The ideology or, or the nationality didn't make much difference. The only, the only army, as a matter of fact, didn't do that was the Bolshevik army because it had a strong ideological basis and because a sub substantial number of its officers were Jewish as well as uh, commissars and so on. So surely there must have been some pogroms done by them too, but as a rule they didn't. So it's not too surprising that uh, Jews placed a certain amount of hope in the Bolshevik regime. But uh, the others uh, did that. So they went through that, they saw uh, lots of their uh, friends murdered. At the same time, while the armies were sweeping across the land, so were the epidemics. And if it was not cholera, it was plague, it was not plague, it was bubonic plague, it was not bubonic plague, it was something else. And lots and lots of people died of that. And if it weren't the murders and the plagues and the epidemics that killed you, you might simply die of starvation, because that was the time of famines and the general economic disarray, at enormous inflation, going over into hyperinflation by about 1919, 1920. So, as you see, it was, to put it mildly, no fun. Get your friend to again. Well, beginning with uh, about 1918, Civil War began then, and the Civil War there, in that part of the country, ended in late 1920. The last major army that was pushed out of uh, what became later the Soviet Union was the Polish army. And then the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, moved too far and the Poles defeated them on the outskirts of Warsaw, so the Bolsheviks pulled back and then finally a truce was arrived at and eventually a, uh, a peace and so on. But you see, even when the, when the Poles were pushed out, this did not uh, put an end to all the uh, mayhem and, uh, and murder and looting, because there were all kinds of remnants of old armies that were still roaming through the land, and uh, by that time demoralized if they were not the Bolsheviks, because the Bolsheviks clearly were winning and uh, doing what they wanted to do so long as they still could do it. And then to top it all off, my mother gave birth to me, so they didn't have enough trouble. She gave birth to me in 1921. That was the, um, the worst time to be born in, in Russia, at least for, for some decades to come. <laughs> there were worse times later on, but... Uh, and so they had that kid. They had that kid. They somehow bought a cow, which they kept behind their house, and somehow found fodder for it to have milk for their kid. <laughs> Uh, later on in 1960, on uh, their instructions, I went to look for the uh, house in which I was, I was born. Actually, it was not too hard to, to find because it was close to the opera house, uh, uh, just a couple of blocks from it. But I, I couldn't identify it. It's quite possible that since then it had been... Uh, it was in Kiev. In it Kiev. Was not in Star That's Kiev. right. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was born in Kiev. But uh, my, most of those years, from 1918 to 1921, my parents did not live in Kiev. And actually, it was much better to live in the countryside. There was more to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were um, 
married in a small town called Fastov, which was uh, a railway junction and a, um, um, a site for a sugar mill. That was beet sugar country, so every little town was site for a sugar mill. And uh, then they lived in some other places, and then they moved uh, to Kiev. Uh, uh, all this time, my father was making a living working uh, as uh, a, an office clerk for one or another sugar factory. First for private sugar factories, and the Bolsheviks came and nationalized them for the nationalized sugar factory. Now, the great advantage of that was that you were paid in sugar. And if you were paid in sugar, which incidentally is true at this moment in, in Russia too, uh, um, the, uh, the money was uh, not only worthless, but getting worthless by an order of magnitude every day, uh, more worthless. And, and therefore, people, uh, employees would be paid in whatever the factory produced. If it produced horseshoes, they'd get horseshoes. <laughs> so, uh, so that was relatively good, because with sugar then, what you would do is go to the village and barter it for flour, for, uh, for uh, whatever. Whatever you would barter for meat, for milk, etc. Because the, uh, the peasants, on the one hand, were in relatively good condition since they were producing food that everybody wanted, and the food could be produced even at that time, in the backward agriculture of that time, even when the economy was on the whole in collapse. And, um, and, but they couldn't produce their own sugar. So they always wanted sugar, and you could buy that. Uh, so my father was working as a clerk, my mother was working as a teacher and whatnot, and then when I came, she was, of course, full-time mother under those conditions. But, um, but then uh, my father moved to Kiev. I'm not even sure exactly when it happened. Maybe when I go through all the documents, which I haven't gone, I've discovered these dates. But, um, um, and it was there that I was born. Uh, on the memorable day of July 5, 1921. Uh, July 5, 1921 was about uh, three months after Lenin had proclaimed the NEP. The NEP was the perestroika of that time. The NEP, which is short for New Economic Policy, and the Russian uh, phrase is abbreviated exactly the same way. Uh, the NEP uh, gave uh, first the peasants and everybody else a lot more freedom to produce and to barter and to trade. But of course at that time, just uh, three months after the NEP was first uh, uh, introduced, introduced initially only in limited respects, it was not obvious that it was in fact later on going to bring to better economic conditions as it did in about uh, two, three years. Um, uh, so uh, life was hell, uh, but there was this one thing that provided some hope and that is the brother in Manchuria. As you recall, he went there in 1916. And uh, the brother in Manchuria, Uncle Lyoba, was doing very well. And at that time, uh, the Soviets uh, were not, as I already mentioned in another context, were not as strict about not letting people out as they became later on, particularly if the people could be ran bought out, ransomed. So basically that's what happened, that uh, my uncle, uh, paid a hefty amount of money uh, as tax or something like that uh, for exit visas for me uh, and I decided to take uh, my parents with me. So the three of us. But then a complication arose because uh, my father's sister, Polya, was there too. Now she had no particular relationship to Uncle Lova at that time. She was simply his sister-in-law, two steps removed. Um, and, um, but she made such a fuss that she wants to go too. And finally, my parents wrote to my uncle and, and said, look, uh, buy her out too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and, and uh, if this were a Hollywood story, of course, the, it would end by Polya and Uncle Lyova getting married, which is exactly what happened. A, a, about five years later. <laughs> and uh, 
anyhow, so, so the four of us took off. But before we took off, first we visited my mother's uh, mother in her, um, in Stara Konstantinov. My grandmother, by that time, was a widow. Uh, a fact that my mother did not learn for some time, because uh, the mail didn't work, and television didn't work, and email didn't work, <laughs> and so on. So my mother didn't learn for some time, and she learned in a very peculiar way. She was then living in Kiev, and she heard that somebody had arrived from Star Konstantinov. How far away was it? About a hundred miles. About a hundred miles away. So yeah. there was communication over a hundred miles was an ordeal. Exactly. I understand. Exactly. Especially if there may have been three or four uh, different armies in between. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my, my mother went to see this person, and uh, they had not been acquainted previously, but... Uh, the one some, who was visiting from... From, uh, from uh, Star Konstantinov yes. in Kiev. And so she asked him, where did you live in Star Konstantinov? He said, well, I rented the room from a widow Sikman. And that's when my mother found out that my, her mother was a widow, and so on. Okay. Anyway, so by 1922, uh, communications were better, of course, uh, the Civil War had ended, and the Soviets were imposing some order and so on. So uh, my parents went to Star Konstantinov to say goodbye, and that was the only time in my life I ever saw my grandmother. So you were one year old? When I was about one year old. So, this is me, in a Russian-style winter coat, a big Russian-style hat, and as you already heard from Joan, this very coat we have right here in this house in Berkeley, some 70 years later. Amy 70 and I plus. found it in your mother's trunk yeah. in the garage over on 29th Street in San Francisco. Yeah, 29th Avenue, yeah. So she took it all the way. All the way. Of course, I used it for a while yet, but, uh, but then after a certain time, it was just packed away. And uh, my mother was a great believer in, uh, in uh, keeping historical memorabilia, for which she had a uh, very liberal definition. <laughs> anyway, so in this picture, here I am, and this is Polya, oh. uh, rather, uh, I must say, prophetically holding me, because indeed that turned out to be her job for the whole trip and beyond. She became my nanny. Polya, in a sense, brought me up. She fed me, and she walked me, and uh, she washed me, and everything. So, my mother here, my father here, my mother's uh, sister Lisa Elizabeth here. Uh, this was my mother's sister Adele. And exactly who these people were, I'm not sure, but I think this was one of my father's sisters and her husband, I think so. Mm -hmm. And who that was, I'm not sure. And what my mother mostly remembered, obviously it was winter given my uh, dress, it was probably late 1922, since on News 23 we already boarded the train. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, my mother particularly remembered was that whenever my grandmother, her mother, would start the wood stove in the kitchen, when she would turn her back, I'll crawl up and blow it out. <laughs> Even then, my my impulses were basically destructive. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's that's most of what I remembered. Now, my grandmother lived for a number of years, and we have here the receipts that she signed for the remittances that she received from her men. Here is a receipt like that. Ah, I see. And what is this receipt for? And this is receipt for. Payment to Miriam Simchovna, Simcha is a Hebrew name, Tsekman, of, uh, the, of a certain sum, which uh, I don't immediately see, it's not, but uh, uh, sent by Tsekman in Harbin, January 25th, 1924. No, that date is not that. 
she signed the receipt on January 25th, 1924, and on March 3rd, 1924, uh, the receipt was delivered uh, through the banking system to her bin. The stamp is uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in her bin. You see, Dalia Vostochny, Evreskoye Central Information Bureau. Uh, actually, it was the Far Eastern Jewish Central Information Bureau that uh, through which, for some reason, this went. Now, in addition to uh, the visit to my grandmother, there were a number of farewell pictures taken. Uh, incidentally, the uh, reverse of this uh, says Harbin, June 12, 1923. This is the photo we just looked at. The photo we just looked at, right. Okay. The reverse of it. And it says, uh, you know, uh, to uh, the people who stayed behind. No, 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 not to the people who stayed behind. No, this was sent to America now, to Uncle Joseph E. Lee and their children. So this was a copy of uh, the picture taken is uh, Stara Konstantina, obviously because uh, my grandmother never went anywhere else in her life. But after we arrived in Harbin and settled down, we uh, either had additional copies made or whatever, and sent one to Uncle Joseph. And how my mother then got it back from Uncle Joseph, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> That was not as difficult as something I could imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so these two pictures we're about to see were taken uh, most likely in Kiev, just before we left on our long trip to Manchuria. So okay, this is me. All right, but here, interesting enough, uh, Grisha and Clara, and this is Misha, who was born three months after me. So I was then about double his age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is my mother, look how thin she is. Yeah. My father, very thin too. My father, incidentally, during this difficult time, also acquired uh, a problem with his lung, which uh, was thought to be uh, tuberculosis, but it wasn't really. I don't know who this is. I don't know who this is. Mm -hmm. This is Grisha, and this is Yaakov, the youngest of the three brothers. We've got a nice shot of you. Yeah, there's kind of a bewildered, what am I doing here kind of look on your face. On my face? Yes, I'd well, say of course, so. I was, I was uh, about to leave for China. Yeah, and nobody really what? explained it. Yeah, and who is that kid on my left? <laughs> anyway. I see you know who looks a little bit like uh, Debbie Grossman? All right, shall we move mm -hmm. to the other one? Yeah. I don't know uh, many people here. The, the big surprise here that this is my mother. Very thin. Who, who's thin and taller than anybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which you wouldn't expect. I think she must be sitting high. She right? must be sitting high, right. And myself again. Now, this may have been in Kiev already uh, because I'm older. And I think these two are Sarah and Shainsa, and their husbands. I'm not sure about the boy, there may have been a boy at that time. Uh, of these two, one is Mola, namely Sheremetka's mother. Which one? I'm not sure which one is Mola. Okay, good. So basically, if uh, I'm not mistaken, these three are my father's sisters. Uh, you notice that the pictures we have seen, the photographs we have seen, are all professionally taken. And of course at that time, especially given the conditions of those days, very, very few people had their own cameras, so one had to go to a professional. And people did that, I think, to reinforce the ties between those who are photographed together, to make sure that people remember each other, to make sure that other loved ones can receive copies of these pictures even if they're further away. And finally, in a sense, probably also to perpetuate themselves. If you have been photographed professionally, that means that something of you will remain forever. There's a case in point here. <laughs>